Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and I'm just back from the John Day River in Eastern Oregon, where we took last year's skin on frame nesting canoes, catamaran them side by side, and spent eight days running the river that way. It was a really cool trip. We saw a lot of interesting stuff on the river. This is my second time running the John Day in skin on frame canoes. And as usual, I learned a lot about the boats, a lot about different camping strategies and river running strategies with those canoes. And I'm gonna share all that in this video. But before we get into the details, as usual, if you're new here and you're not familiar with my work and my skin on frame canoe designs, make sure that you check out the first video that I filmed in 2021 here, where I give a really comprehensive overview of our skin on frame canoe building system, how the boats are built, and also how the designs are evolving. Cause that's gonna give you a really solid background to understand these skin on frame boats. In this video, I'm just gonna talk about things that are specific to this particular trip relating to the boats themselves. So anyways, starting out with the river itself, the John Day River is a really special place. It is the fourth longest undammed river in America. It flows 280 miles from its source high in the mountains down to the confluence with the Columbia River. It starts out in kind of a high pine forest dry landscape, and then it cuts through a super deep rocky desert canyon. And then finally it finishes out in rolling hills and grasslands where it's super hot and also super windy. So the section that we decided to go on this time was the most popular section of the John Day River, which is between Clarno and Cottonwood State Park. We actually ended up going down a little bit farther than that. It ends up being about 70 miles cutting through a desert canyon. It's got that really beautiful columnar basalt and it's mostly swift water, mostly flat water, but it does have a reasonable amount of class one and class two rapids, including one very long and pretty significant class three rapid that we ended up lining the canoes around so we didn't have to deal with that. And so what we used were last year's skin on frame nesting canoes. The reason I brought these is because literally they were the canoes that I had. And also I didn't wanna take this year's canoes across the mountains because my current batch of canoes is the same size, which means that they don't nest together. And something I've gotten really addicted to since I started doing it is that ability to put one canoe inside the other because it just cuts the windage down on top of your car dramatically, which makes it ride a lot easier. You get better gas mileage and it's a little bit safer especially when you're going to be driving through literally the windiest place in the entire state now moving on to actually running the river the way that we decided to run this time was something that i first started experimenting with on my original trip down the john day with the two smaller pack canoes and that is using two boards to connect the canoes together like a catamaran. And the reason we did this initially is because those boats were way too small for what we were trying to do and they were swamping constantly. And so by improvising a couple of boards to hook them together with some ball bungees that I happened to have with me, we were able to run the rapids and even though we would swamp, we were still upright, we could still paddle the canoe and we could still maneuver. And it was also pretty easy just to bring it to shore and dump it out. And by the end of the trip, we were sold on it. It's actually a really fun way to run a river. And so over the last three or so years, the catamaran system has evolved to be a permanent feature of our skin on frame canoe building system. With the inherent flexibility of the framework combined with some of the reinforcements we do, combined with the bungee attachment system, it allows the canoes to feel reasonably stiff while you're paddling them side by side, but also have enough flexibility to articulate over waves if you're running rapids or even if you're just out on a lake that has some big waves that you're going over. Now, just kind of generally, I wanna go into this in more detail because it's something people have a lot of curiosity about. The advantages to running catamaran side by side is one, it's a really cool social experience. When you're in a long tandem canoe, oftentimes you're talking to a person's back and it feels like you can't communicate as well as you might like to. And if you're just relaxing and having lunch, it's not quite the same social experience as just sitting beside someone where you could look over and talk to them. You can pass things back and forth. Also, it's nice to be that stable because it means you can stand up to look down river. And especially if you've got a rapid coming up, I can boat scout things that I might have to land and otherwise scout by walking. So it's a little bit more efficient that way and it gives me an extra 100 yards or so to plan what I'm doing. It also just makes a nice stable platform for photography or for fishing if you're into that. If you've got kids, you've got dogs, obviously hooking the boats side by side is gonna make it a lot less likely that somebody's gonna get rowdy and tip one of the boats over. And then something that we personally like to do is to use the catamaran boards 
in conjunction with the sails that are integrated into our canoe designs to run downwind in much higher winds than we would be able to if we were running independently solo with each other. And that's just a lot of fun because it means that we can go a lot faster. And it seems like every trip I'm finding new things about the catamaran boards that I like. And on this trip, we discovered that having the canoes hooked side by side let us access campsites with really steep approaches that we wouldn't have been able to get to if we were just solo in our canoes. And another thing I didn't actually learn on this trip, but I forgot to mention earlier, is that it's a lot easier and a lot safer to walk the canoe through shallow water. Say you're getting into an area that's too shallow to paddle, or if you're trying to work around rapids like Liz and I had to a couple times, having both the boats to grab onto while you walk behind them just gives you a lot better stability and a lot better footing. And then finally, the boards themselves actually provide a flat enough, comfortable enough surface that they give you an alternate sitting position. So if you get tired of kneeling or being crouched down on the seat, you can just sit your butt up really high on the catamaran board and just gives you a nice stretch. Also just gives you a little bit better vantage. So lots of cool things about the catamaran system, but just like everything, there are downsides as well. And specifically what I'm talking about here doesn't relate so much to the catamaran itself, but just the difference between two soldiers solos versus one tandem. And anytime that you've got two solos, you're always going to have more wetted surface, which means you're going to have a little bit more drag, and you're also going to have more frontal surface facing into the wind, which can especially be frustrating when you're running on trips where you have headwinds. River trips like this, you've usually got really strong up canyon winds in the afternoon, and you're always going to get pushed back more if you're side by side, as opposed to if you're stacked one in front of the other. And the way that I deal with this is the way that I deal with wind on any trip. I try not to paddle into it because it doesn't matter if you're in a kayak or a canoe or two solos, wind sucks in general. And the fortunate thing is, is that in most places in the world, generally the wind is a lot quieter in the morning, which means that as long as you can wake up early, get on the water, make your miles, you can usually stay out of the worst part of the wind. And getting up early also gives you the advantage that you're gonna see a lot more animals and usually you're gonna get your pick of campsites because everybody else is usually getting on the water later. And just as you're looking for campsites, everybody else is out on the river still trying to make their miles. So lots of advantages to just waking up early and skipping the wind in the first place. And actually, now that I think about it, traveling with two solos catamaran together is actually gonna be more efficient than traveling with two solos separately because one of the big things that detracts from the efficiency of solo canoes is the time that you spend waiting for your corrective stroke. So having two boats together side by side means that even though you're gonna have more windage coming straight forward than you would in a tandem, you are gonna be able to lean over and just keep digging and digging and digging and really pushing into that wind. But of course, it's always better if you don't have to. So anyways, that was a lot longer than I meant to go on about the catamaran system. It's just something that I like to talk about because obviously I'm excited about it. It's not something you see people doing very often, but as long as you design the entire system to be able to handle the forces that are involved, it can be a really interesting and really versatile way to get out on the river and then very last thing here I want to mention is that it is simple enough that you can take it apart even if you're on the water, which means that anytime you want to, you can switch to being two independent solos. So that's it for the catamaran boards. Now let's talk about how these boats were actually constructed and how that construction fares against the demands and the conditions in this kind of a trip. Now, the way that these boats were built is with what I call my standard layup, which is red cedar stringers, white oak ribs, a nine ounce nylon skin, and four coats of two-part polyurethane. And what that would be equivalent to in other types of canoe building is a medium weight carbon Kevlar layup. So something that is designed mostly for flat water and swift water, something that has enough strength to handle the occasional impact, but not something that you wanna be heading out with heavily loaded boats and crashing into stuff all day long like we did on this trip. So obviously these boats weren't designed for this kind of a use, but sometimes I find that by taking boats that are built a little bit too lightly and really pushing them and crashing into things, I can learn things about where the vulnerabilities are in the design, which occasionally lets me reinforce things selectively as opposed to making the whole frame a lot heavier. So 
Normally, if I was designing a boat for this kind of a trip where you are going to have a lot of gear and you're going to be crashing into things, I would go with spruce or pine stringers. I would probably make the ribs a 64 thicker. I would bump up to a 12 ounce skin and I would probably put four coats of polyurethane around the whole thing and two extra coats of polyurethane across the bottom. And that's going to be more matched to the kind of things that we were doing. And then of course, if you're really gonna be running a lot of shallow water where you're just constantly scraping and dragging the boats back and forth, you might even step up to an even heavier layup than that. But at that point, I think it makes sense just to go ahead and purchase a plastic kayak or a plastic canoe. And if you're interested in learning more about skin on frame durability, you can check out the separate video that I made specifically on that topic. So kind of moving back to this river trip, obviously we were heading down the river in canoes that weren't really designed for it. And something that made it worse is that the boats were dramatically overloaded. Normally when I'm out camping, whether it's in a kayak or a canoe or any other kind of small watercraft, I carry a backpacker style load. So for example, I've got a base kit that weighs about 20 pounds and then whatever food or water I have on top of that can bring me up to about 30, sometimes even 40 pounds, depending on the trip and the duration. So that's a pretty light load compared to how other people often go kayaking or canoeing. But the reason I like to travel that way is because it makes the boats faster, it makes them more maneuverable and more responsive. Um, it also is just a lot less of a pain in the butt to, to deal with less crap in camp. But I'm always curious about trying new things. So on this trip, I brought everything that I see other people bringing on the water. We brought folding chairs, we brought firewood, we brought a fire pan, we brought a bunch of heavy food. And not surprisingly, it really impacted the performance of the canoes. So we were way overloaded. It made the maneuverability of the catamaran a lot less than it was on previous trips when we were loaded more lightly. And when we crashed into things, we crashed into things really, really hard. So basically every single landing on this trip was a crash landing into the beaches. We were dragging our boats over obstacles. And there were a few times that we hit a few things so hard that I started to get a little bit concerned. So first one of those was in the entrance exam to the John Day River, which is a rapid called Clarno, which is a one mile long class three rapid. It's got a class three drop at the top that you can sneak around depending on the flow. It's got a long class one, two section also depending on the flow. And then at the bottom, it has a significant class three to four rapid, which carries some pretty significant consequences. And because we were traveling in lightly built boats and also because we didn't have a lot of flotation, we already knew in advance that we were going to try to line the boats around that lower portion of the rapid, which is just barely possible at this flow. But to be able to do that, as you approach that lower rapid, you have to catch a fast moving eddy. And I'm just going to let the video clip here play. I'll make sure I turn up the sound so you can really hear this impact. So not exactly the most friendly thing to do with a lightweight layup skin on frame canoe, but it didn't damage it. It didn't punch any holes in it. It just ended up wearing the rub strip at the end and also scraping up the bottom pretty bad. And then we worked our way around that rapid. And that was really our strategy for this entire river, which was to run the flat water, the swift water, the class one. And then as we started getting into the class two to three territory, which there's only two places the entire river that are like that, we just took the conservative route and either walked the boats around or lined the boats around. So we didn't take any risks with those heavily loaded boats without enough flotation. And that isn't to say that you can't use skin on frame boats in those circumstances. You just have to do what I was just talking about, which is build it a little bit more heavily. And then just like any type of wilderness trip in a canoe, you want to make sure you've got a ton of flotation if there's a chance that you're going to end up swamping and swimming beside the boat so it doesn't get wrapped around a rock. So anyways, our second major impact was actually completely my fault. I was spending time as usual focusing on filming as opposed to focusing on what I was supposed to be doing. And I started a ferry just a little bit too late to sneak around a rock. We ended up crashing into that straight sideways. And I'm just gonna let this piece of video run as well because it's kind of entertaining. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Oh my god! So obviously that was kind of a hectic moment there. I wasn't super worried about it just because I've been crashing into things in skin boats for many years and I have a pretty good sense of what it takes to actually damage something. But Liz doesn't have quite that same background and it's pretty understandable to be nervous in that kind of a situation because what you're watching is the full weight of two people, two canoes and two 70 pound gear loads crashing sideways into a rock with nothing but a nine ounce layer of fabric, four coats of polyurethane, and a little bit of wood behind it. And it always surprises me that even our lightweight layup can stand up to that type of abuse. But like I said before, if it's something you're gonna be doing frequently, you do wanna bump up to a heavier layup. Otherwise, you're just gonna wear things out prematurely. So I think a good rule to follow here would be that anything that you wouldn't be willing to do in a medium to lightweight carbon Kevlar canoe is something that you probably should try to avoid in our medium to lightweight skin on frame layup. So moving on to the actual trip itself here, rather than me just sitting here and trying to tell you about everything that we did, what we did was film the entire time we were on the water and most of the time we were in camp. And I just spent a solid week mixing all that footage together and putting it to music. And what we ended up with, I think, is one of the nicest videos that we've made so far. So make sure you check that out. You can go on a virtual trip down the John Day River in skin on frame canoes. All right, so I'm sure this video is starting to get a little bit long, so I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I was planning on talking in more detail about the section of river that we ran below the normal takeout from Cottonwood Canyon State Park, 20 miles down to McDonald Crossing. It's a really interesting section of river with some really good things and also some really bad things. So if you wanna learn more about that, feel free to find my email address on my website and email me directly, or you can just ask a question down in the comments and I'll tell you a little bit about what's waiting for you if you decide to run that lower and much less traveled section of the John Day River. So anyways, our last thing I wanna say is that we've got two really cool videos coming up here on the channel pretty soon. I'm going to be giving a detailed video of my latest multi-purpose 14 foot solo canoe design. And then also I'm making a separate video about how I pack for solo trips, whether it's on a river or a lake or any other type of body of water, I guess you could say. So those should be really interesting videos. Make sure you watch out for those. As always, if you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. You can also find me on my website, capefalconkayaks.com, where I have skin on frame building videos, plan sets, and various free skin on frame resources. You can also find us on Instagram, at Cape Falcon Builds, where I post a daily build blog of everything I'm doing here in the shop. And even if you're not normally a social media person, I would really encourage you to check out the Instagram. Making YouTube videos like this is really time consuming. And what that means is that most of the stuff that we do never makes it onto the YouTube channel. Whereas on Instagram, it's really easy for me to throw up videos and photos and text, and I can share a level of detail that you're not gonna find anywhere else except for inside of my paid courses. So a good example for that would be, I just finished a nine part Instagram series that goes into a lot more detail about specifically running the John Day River and what you're gonna see on different sections. And I'm always talking about the design work that I do here, sharing my successes and my failures to really bring you guys into the skin on frame design process. So once again, that is at Cape Falcon Builds on Instagram, if that interests you. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Take care, be safe on the water, and have fun building your skin boat.